I want to begin by acknowledging uh, my co-authors on this body of work, uh, starting with uh, Ajinkya, uh, who was a master student who did most of this work, Sumesh, who was my collaborator, Pallav and Srikant, along with another graduate student, Pawan Bunkin Pilevar, who uh, got this whole direction started for us in our research group. I think Pallab was a postdoc at that time when we kind of started thinking about this. I think I know he has done other work in the same direction going forward. All right, so we'll broaden the base from human crowds first uh, slightly, and talk a little bit about uh, active matter. This is a very active field of research out there. Uh, basically, matter that is able to propel itself. Okay, so there is. Uh, from many different length scales. This is bacteria in a petri dish to fish in a large aquarium that exhibits collective motion to not so alive rods on a vibrated surface. They show all the characteristics of being active. I mean rods on a vibrated surface basically gain their energy from the substrate. They behave much like bacteria do. In fact, they show all the patterns that, uh, that bacteria exhibit in a live system. With this as the base, let us move to a system that is actually human. Now, this is a, a video of uh, pilgrims on Hajj circumambulating the Kaaba. It has been sped up 10 times to make certain features more easy to observe. Now, if you notice, there is a very clear, I mean, a first striking resemblance to a swirling fluid flow of some kind. You know. So, the idea of a continuum begins to emerge at a length scale of this camera essentially, whereas as you zoom in, there is uh, more discrete matter, individual beings trying to uh, make their way around this. Now, if you notice, there's a couple of uh, features of this that I want to point out. You notice that there is uh, people on the edge here moving somewhat faster than the people near the Kaaba. And there is also, if you notice in these regions here, you can observe signs of wave propagation. Um, you will see these are actually people walking, but you will see a wave that is uh, propagating in the forward direction <coughs> at a speed that depends on the, uh, on various characteristics. Essentially, these are more or less like density waves. So, at the scale we are observing, where we begin to look at this more or less like a continuum, there are density waves and a, there is a swirling flow with density waves superimposed. Okay, so, that is the overall picture. Now, if you think of, uh, you know, probably 500,000 people gather to a place like this every day during the Hajj season and 500,000 people in a in an enclosure like this is is a very high density. In fact, per square meter, it is on the order of at least 5 to 6 people. Okay, so, you are essentially packing a lot of active matter into one small space and then you are beginning to observe these phenomena. Okay, so, our objective is going to be to understand the dynamics of the crowd at this scale. Okay, so, you know, when you have people packed into this scale, there are many things that could go wrong. Stampedes make news quite a bit. This gives you a quick picture of, you know, for the in the last 50 odd years, where all have uh, stampedes happened. And if you look at a quick view of fatality versus the actual crowd gathered, there is not much of a correlation. It is very weak at best. Okay? Now, what this suggests is that there is no the actual number of people gathered into an enclosure is not really the problem. It is the dynamics of the crowd that seems to make a, a difference of some kind. A picture, uh, you know, we saw the Hajj, you know, that happens once a year. There is another scene that actually bothers me quite a bit in this scenario. This is, it has been sped up 10 times, but it is a picture of uh, people in Delhi getting out of the metro and getting in at Rajiv Gandhi Chowk station every day, twice a day. If you look at this from that same zoomed out perspective, what you essentially see is a jet of human beings exiting into a crowd uh, of a crowd that is practically stationary. And if one were to look at this uh, on the scale of a continuum, 
you essentially have a velocity profile here that has an inflection point, right. So, it is bound to be unstable and you have not one such jets, you have as many jets as you have doors to the metro train. So, you have basically a velocity profile in this continuum field that is inherently linearly unstable and it could transition into a different state just from you know some form of an instability that could arise. Now, remember these are all thinking people. So, what uh, some trigger some stimulus could could uh, have them react in a way that that we may not like. So, this is one of my one of the scariest uh, problems I think and this is by the way not just an Indian problem this is even bigger in other places of the world. So, let us quickly do a, a classification of the literature. Uh, as to who has thought about these and in what context. Okay. The continuum models as it turns out were the first where they came before these so called agent based models. Uh, civil engineering community has looked at continuum models for traffic for a long time and uh, so the agent based models are more recent. We will focus more on that because that is the body of work we will discuss today. That started with, uh, with Wichek and Helbing they kind of they were one of the early people to look at agent based models of human behavior. And uh, if you look at the body of work itself based on these models there are and as well as experiments there are uh, usually dilute crowd experiments these are the kinds you know like let us say less than 2 people per square meter. This is the level at which you can get ethical clearance to do like real human experiments in a lab. Okay. And then there are analysis of CCTV feed from large crowd gatherings especially accident videos there is a lot of this. In fact, my favorite journal here is Physica both Physica A and D have a large body of literature on analyzing accident videos uh, and making sense of why the accident happened from a physics perspective. I just included a couple of references these are typically on you know at least 3 if not approaching 5 or 6 people packed into 1 square meter. But these are uncontrolled experiments and usually the CCTV cameras are not placed at points where you can get quantitatively accurate data it is not that is not the purpose to start with. Okay, so, this becomes a big a bottleneck in the, in studying this field that experiments cannot be done at the scale we envision uh, in any meaningful way. Now, I want to point you to two really nice reviews now obviously, these are dated now they go back to early 2000s, but they really set the ball rolling in many ways uh, in both these continuum as well as agent based uh, model directions. Uh, I want to specifically quote from the continuum from this annual reviews paper by Hughes, where he says the flow of crowd motion that is the field of thinking fluids is an intriguing area of research with great promise. So, it is not just an active fluid, but a thinking fluid they respond to stimuli from in many different ways. So, the objective of these agent based models are going to be to capture the thinking phenomenologically into a set of mathematical equations. And uh, we can argue till the cows come home whether my way of capturing that is right or yours, but that is what makes this field uh, interesting. Okay, a few quick uh, examples of again analysis of uh, disaster situations from, from the literature. There is two basic kinds of uh, dense crowd disasters if you will that one needs to be aware of crushes and stampedes. Crush is basically a situation where a group of people are pushed up against a barricade or against a wall of some kind and the, the loss of life or the fatality occurs due more due to asphyxiation. So, you are essentially pressed, pressed up against a wall that, that you know where you are unable to get out of. So, this is a, a picture from, from Bottinelli's paper of people gathered outside a Walmart on Black, Black Friday morning to get the best sale. Okay. Now, they analyze the, quote, the streamlines essentially the path lines of people going in towards the entrance and you can see essentially what looks like a, a sink flow and this sink flow just like any other sink flow in your let us say your uh, kitchen sink is unstable to azimuthal perturbations. So, when you have people moving like this, this this flow is unstable to a perturbation in this kind and if you have walls or barriers you essentially have 
high pressure regions in these parts that would cause asphyxiation and crush. This is one of the problems with, with the densely packed crowds. Now, and uh, the second is stampedes, we will come to that a little later, but as a, as a kind of a neat aside, there is a body of literature out there where they are trying to use animals as surrogates for people to understand the dynamics. Now, I do not know many of you would have actually heard this, but here is a picture that shows it. That sheep wanting to get back into the barn, go into the barn faster if you place this obstacle. Okay, so, you essentially end up streamlining the flow that lets all the sheep back into the barn faster than if you had the door wide open like that. Now, this uh, goes back to jamming in, in granular, granular matter and this is an example from active matter. The best example of or one of the most recent examples of a really devastating stampede, really unfortunate event, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, event was uh, in 2010 in Duisburg, where they had a, it was a, a rock concert of some kind, it was called Love Parade. And there was a, a tunnel and there were people packed into the tunnel that wanted to uh, all stream out and as a result there was essentially what and there is a lot of analysis, there is a lot of papers that have analyzed uh, the videos from this, but this was one of the stampedes that I guess is an example of where poorly designed passageways have resulted in uh, you know in an unfortunate accident. So, these kind of set the stage for what are all the things one needs to look for when designing uh, human crowd management systems and uh, what we want to talk about over the next half an hour or so is to provide the backbone mathematical framework if you will to understand these. The earliest version I will just talk about the, the forerunner model and then go back into the more detailed version that, that we used. The forerunner model is due to Thomas Vichek where uh, he says all the particles in, in a given system and let us just keep it two dimensional move with a constant speed v naught and they choose their direction theta by averaging a neighborhood crowd and adding a noise to it. So, essentially you have a, you know they try to average their immediate neighbors and then uh, with some will added on. So, meaning they are not going to try to follow that strictly, they have their own uh, you know mind of their own some so to say. This is the, this is what is called the intrinsic noise version. The extrinsic version of this is where each the noise, the averaged uh, direction is sensed with a noise and the agent follows that sensed direction. So, in other words the agent has no free will here to choose a direction, but their sensing of the neighborhood directions is off by this noise. Now, as it turns out this was proposed you know in 1995 and then the, the extrinsic version was proposed in 2004 there has been a, a lot of uh, literature discussing the dynamics of this model. It is a very simple model, but captures the core essence of how crowds move and the discussion has been around the, the order of the phase transition, where Vichek showed that uh, both these models would essentially be first order in phase transition. What uh, Gregoire and Chate later on showed was that the extrinsic version is actually a second order phase transition and that what they observed was more or was more due to finite size effects. effects. Okay, so, I want to talk about the model that we used. So, we invoke a dynamical version of that. So, with where the agent has a dynamical inertia associated with their with its motion and there is three components of the forces that is that are responsible for the motion. First is particle particle interaction you know an agent trying to maintain an elbow room we model that using a simple soft sphere repulsion and then they need to propel oneself. Now, this propulsion has two components to actually three components to it there is a beta that is directed along its current velocity vector. So, this keeps in uh, line with the idea of inertia and a body continuing to move in a in a straight line. Uh, and then a gamma that says that if I have a particular motive to move in a particular direction, gamma captures a the, an acceleration towards the motive unit in the direction of the motive unit vector. 
this correction here is essentially to limit the maximum speed to you know to some finite value if if i didn't have this an individual particle with no neighbors would accelerate ad infinitum and we want to limit that to you know using this alpha and both beta and alpha beta and uh, beta and alpha are essentially parameters that are captured from a single single human walk experiment if you will where I beta is a measure of how fast I can accelerate and alpha is determined by my terminal speed at which I would like to walk. The third term this was the novelty that we brought to this work to this body of work in some sense is a way to align the ith particle to its neighbors and so there is a force a penalty if you will for the ith particle to move differently from the neighboring crowd and this Dif the a force proportionate to this difference in the velocity vectors is is going to try to correct the the velocity of the ith particle more to be in tune with the crowd and the crowd the local crowd velocity is calculated as a weighted average of all the j neighbors uh, with a gaussian weighting function if you will so as the particles move farther and farther out uh, the particles are farther and farther out from the center of the ith particle the it is their effect goes down exponentially ok. So, this is the the basic model that we are going to use to you know for the duration of this work ok. So, let us start by looking at some. So, we will keep coming back to this parameter mu ok. Mu is basically captures the the inability or ability of an individual to align with their immediate neighboring crowd. We are going to keep all other parameters constant and focus on varying mu as to understand the, the dynamical transitions that are expected ok. So, some simple definitions we will use we define an order parameter which is basically the the radial speed the average radial speed and the average uh, which is a function of the average radial speed and the average azimuthal speed. One could also use the angular velocity as a as a scalar order parameter, but you know we chose to do it this way the reason being an angular velocity is best defined for a circular enclosure like we have chosen for this body of work, but if one wants to generalize this work beyond just a circular enclosure then you need something slightly more detailed ok. Now, we define another parameter called the panic factor. Now, the core definition or the first time this was invoked in the literature was due to Helbing in 2004, but we kind of redefined it to be more general than the way they chose I will come back to that in a minute. But if you will this beta is an acceleration of the individual particle. So, this panic factor is a ratio of an individual's desire to move in a in a chosen direction as a fraction of the total desire in terms of the individual desire plus where the crowd will take the person. So, this fraction would basically dictate how dominant the crowd is going to be on the given individual. And then finally, we define a thermodynamic pressure this you know is basically the variance of the velocity as calculated from an immediate neighborhood of the ith particle. And this variance basically tells you kind of the randomness in motion around a given individual and if you will the the pressure due to collisions that that individual is susceptible to. I will show you three videos at three different values of mu. The lowest value is where uh, there is very low coordination if you will between the crowd and the individuals. Now, I must say that the red and yellow particles are all alike it is just a way to show us visualize where the particles are going. So, that gives you what more or less looks like thermal diffusion ok. So, essentially people meandering around with no attachment to their neighbors at a slightly increased value of mu you see that the that the whole phase is practically frozen or in some kind of an oscillatory uh, motion. You can see there are you know a wave propagation is prevalent here and it essentially comes from the soft sphere potential uh, that basically allows individuals to keep elbow room to maintain an elbow room. And then finally, as mu further increases you start to get large long range collective motion ok. So, just by varying mu which is our parameter that defines how well coordinated an individual is to their immediate neighbors one gets 
uh, three different kinds of dynamics. Okay, so we now go through a whole series of experiments, uh, numerical experiments where I start with a very low value of mu and then simulate a higher value of mu with the dynamical steady state achieved from the previous value of mu and continue parametrically continue mu. What we see is that there is a critical value mu 2 at which there is a sharp jump to a, an orderly motion state. And then as you continue forward meaning increase mu you go down that path. From here as you decrease you reach another second critical value we define called mu 1 at which there is one more sharp jump back to the disordered uh, state. Okay, so, I will just quickly play these two videos which are so you see this is in the orderly motion and a, a small change in the mu at about 10 seconds you start to see the early signs of it slowing down if you will even before the slowdown happens and then it goes into what looks like either a frozen or some kind of a diffusive motion kind of a state. Okay, and this is a like we say it is a sharp transition. Now, what we are interested in is first understanding the precursors of why this motion stops to give rise to this state, what would be the precursors that I can sense uh, in the in the early uh, in the dynamics of the orderly state at these very low values of mu that would then allow me to sense that there is an impending phase transition. And secondly we want to understand what are the uh, is there a way to reverse this phase transition. So, in other words at let us say I have a certain coordination between individuals a certain value of mu and I am in the disorderly state what does it take for me to get this crowd moving. So, that is that is going to be the two questions we will try to pursue answers to. Okay, so, these were both spontaneous transitions. So, we asked now the question if I am at some value of mu between mu 1 and mu 2 can I force this transition to the ordered state. And in order to do that we say I will pick a group of individuals Okay, now, in the while the system is in the disordered state, I am going to pick a group of individuals and I am going to give them a motive to move in a particular direction of my choice and I am going to see the energy or actually more specifically the impulse required to trans to make this transition happen. So, if you look at this, this is the impulse I am going to pick n g individuals each of mass m having an acceleration gamma that I leave on for a time duration tau. So, that is an impulse that I am giving to the system and I am going to see how much what does this impulse do to allow this system to transition from the disordered state to the ordered state. So, as it turns out it is also a sharp transition not surprisingly that for if I let uh, this i by p naught be like 0.62 the system is dragged up to a particular value of order parameter, but it relaxes back to the disordered state where the average speed is 0. But if I go to a slightly higher value you essentially have the system transitioning to the ordered state. If this is because when any time you have a, a hysteresis loop like this you have a separatrix and you have to take the system up to the separatrix for it to spontaneously transition back to the ordered state. So, the question is where does this separatrix lie as it turns out because these are not equilibrium problems these are all dynamical phases these are non equilibrium the specific arrangement of these ng individuals now has a bearing okay, because the velocity field is heterogeneous in the ordered state there is a preferred location of these ng individuals where the separatrix is closest to the disordered state or makes the transition as easy as possible. So, we looked at several different arrangements of these red dots or our what we call our game changers including just randomly placing them everywhere to placing them at different annuli ok. As it turns out these are the separatrices that you get numerically obtained from simulations for different values of the game changes place uh, different ring radii as well as where they are just placed kind of in a dispersed environment. The blue line which corresponds to r by r of 0.7 gives us the optimal placement at which so uh, of these game changes at which the system has to be has to cross this value of order parameter before it spontaneously uh, goes into an ordered motion state. So, now we are left with the question why is this r by r of 0.7 optimal for this problem. 
okay, so we will come back to answering this in a little bit. The game changers are essentially I want to the disordered state is where the it is in a thermal diffusion kind of motion right. The ordered state is where it is in a motion along the azimuthal uh, direction. So, gamma essentially forces them to move in e theta direction. So, imagine these red dots moving along e theta for a time duration tau okay, and then they stop. Now, if, if n g is such that it is this ratio is 0 0.62 they go back to the disordered state if n g is slightly more it transitions. So, the, it, the resemblance is very cursory. So, we have to be very careful with that. Uh, yes, the, the fluxes or the momenta are conserved on the individual particle level, but I must also say that that mu term results in a net dissipation. So, the total energy. So, in other words, if at particular if an instance if at an instant beta went to 0 sharply for all individuals motion would cease after the dynamical effects have been forgotten. Okay. So, in some sense momenta is conserved momentum momenta of all the particles are individually conserved, but uh, it is net dissipative. So, I want to show you the fluid dynamic velocity field if you will. Okay. So, these are the time these are the instantaneous agent velocities they show a nice azimuthal motion for the most part. The right half is what we defined as the panic factor redefined down here. Okay. So, you can see that there are regions near the wall where this panic factor is close to 1 meaning it is dominated primarily by individual motion. Okay. But the minimum value which happens somewhere here is actually half it never goes below half I will come back and talk about why. On the on the right hand side we define the crowd pressure as a variance. Now, by the way we also looked at many other different measures of stress in this field uh, including mechanical stress induced by the spring potential force. Okay. Now, as they are all uh, they all scale with each other. So, I have chosen to only show you the thermodynamic uh, stress if you will. Now, the thermodynamic stress in the rotary phase is highest near the wall here and uh, whereas, in the disordered phase it is more or less uniform. So, while you have low stress and high stress patches while the crowd is moving when it is in this disordered state it is more or less homogeneous the stress state is more or less homogeneous. The reason for this will become apparent in the next few slides, but it is essentially if you if you were watching those the third video carefully you would have seen that the azimuthal motion is not just centered around the geometric center of the circle, but there is a net precessive motion and that precessive motion causes high stress and low stress. So, you can imagine that there is all there is kind of a, a jet against a wall kind of a flow superposed on top of the azimuthal rotation that causes this high stress region we will come back to that maybe a little later. Okay, so, this is the uh, total spring potential energy and the, the total kinetic energy just to show you orders of magnitude uh, in relation to each other. In the disordered phase now I must warn you that this is 5 times the axis of the uh, spring potential energy. So, when the system is in motion most of the energy is in the uh, kinetic energy and only a small fraction is, is in this compression between particles. When it is in the disordered phase also that is still true. The total kinetic energy in the individual particles uh, meandering motion is still more than the, the energy contained in the springs compressing and decompressing. So, if I now look at the, the an Eigen mode the, the top Eigen modes associated with the motion like we discussed the, the primary mode is a pure azimuthal mode but superposed on it with reasonably high energy content if you will almost 4 percent of the energy is in these two modes where the crowd is essentially moving orthogonal to uh, basically moving towards a barrier. So, this is the crush mode. So, when you have people moving you have uh, you know the orderly evacuation, but these are the two modes that are deadly these are the modes that one needs to be watchful for. So, when you look at the analysis of any kind of a real crowd video an Eigen mode decomposition like this and the strength of the, uh, the energy content in these modes essentially gives us a measure of the propensity for crush in those modes. 
in comparison the disordered state the modes are you know even the most energetic mode is very weak. So, it is essentially more or less uniformly distributed into into white noise. Okay, so, we still are left with the question of y.7 and I want to use this slide to see if we can understand that. The red line here is, um, is the actual time averaged azimuthal velocity profile in the domain. Okay. Now, this happens to show a maximum at about 0 0.7 and as a consequence of that the panic factor which is now also a function of the radial coordinate shows a minimum at that same 0 0.7. Now, why does this happen? Because when the velocity is maximum where the velocity is maximum is where the, the ability for the low for an individual to follow the crowd is the greatest and that seems to uh, basically cause a panic factor value which is where m beta the individuals desire to be uh, to walk at their own speed and the crowd walking at the same speed are more or, are more or less balanced. So, when these two are balanced in fact that gives us the magnitude of the crowd velocity if you will. Okay. So, the fact that this shows a maximum at 0 0.7 is not really a coincidence. Now, I want to explain this a little bit. Now, imagine I have fluid in a circular container and uh, instead of our usually gravity like body force, I have an, a body force that acts azimuthally on water Newtonian fluid. And if one were to solve this problem analytically, one gets a velocity profile you know the V theta as a function of R and for a pure Newtonian fluid that maximum occurs at 0.5. Okay, so, at, a, at an R by R value of half the velocity profile is maximum going back towards 0 near the wall again due to no slip at the axis of rotation it is also 0 because of symmetric conditions. So, what this is telling me is that this crowd of individuals has some non Newtonian nature to it more like a it is like a shear thinning nature to it if you will that where the maximum shear is likely to occur near the wall viscosity is lower whereas, where the shear is lower near the center the viscosity is higher and as a result the maximum is shifted from 0 0.5 towards 0 0.7 okay. and this shift in the velocity profile and the consequent minimum in the panic factor is now leading us towards a direction where we can generalize these results to a geometry that is just not as simple as a circular enclosure. Now, these are the velocity profiles in the same in the disordered state as you can tell, tell there is really no profile to them they just it is it is a homogeneous state whereas, there is a heterogeneity in the velocity profile of the particles in the ordered state. Domain size now does that matter the answer is yes. Now, all the results we have seen thus far correspond to this maroon line if the domain size was smaller or if the domain size was larger the basic physics remains the same in that it is a first order phase transition, but the width of the hysteresis loop increases. So, for larger and larger domains there is a greater and greater range of mu's over which you could likely force this phase transition from a disordered state to an ordered state. So, just to reiterate the point the critical impulse required to cross the separatrix appears to decrease with an increasing domain size, but this is a bit misleading because the, the impulse is lower but the number of individuals n g as a fraction of the total count is, is increasing. So, essentially the number of individuals I have to I have to influence to begin moving in a particular direction is greater for the larger domain size, but the impulse I have to grant them to force this phase transition decreases, but the value of the optimal location at which these game changers are most effective still remains 0 0.7 and the reason for that is this velocity maximum does not change. So, just to confirm that this is indeed a phase of first order phase transition uh, we calculated the binder cumulant of this uh, uh, from this order parameter and what we see is a sharp dip in the order parameter just prior to the transition and then again settling down to a uh, a value from between from two thirds to one thirds and uh, the fact that the the magnitude of this dip is increasing with domain size is also a feature of a first order phase transition to 
understand size effects. Okay, just to show again that what we are discussing is not an artifact of just a circular domain. We looked at a periodic domain and the, the answers are the physics is the same. We looked at uh, uh, rectangular enclosures to show that we do still get the same vertical state. The magnitudes may change, but the physics is still the same. This came out of a reviewer's insistence and I liked it actually. The fact you know when you have these individuals that you are trying to influence, the question that the reviewer asked us was are the people around that experiencing a greater pressure? In other words, is there a real force, is there a mechanical force that is going to uh, cause this uh, motion to happen and if so, what are the detrimental consequences of that? As it turns out, we track the pressure of the, around in the neighborhood of the game changers as well as the non-game changers in some in the same geographical location in the domain, but far away, sufficiently far away as far as the computation of the stress is concerned. And what we show is that there is no real difference between the disordered state to the ordered state. The path taken by both these groups of individuals is the same. So this basically shows that it is more or less a kinetic phase transformation uh, that I need to get the groups of individuals moving in a particular direction and mu if you will helps align their motion and, and then causes a nucleation growth process if you will to basically transition the whole domain into an orderly state of motion. Okay. Now some more signs uh, to tell us where if the phase transition is impending, uh, a nice clue lies in the spatial organization of these individuals. So if you were to look at let us say I, this is basically a little tiny slice of the domain of the large domain and I am looking at a spatial Fourier transform of this little slice of the domain at four different values of mu. What you see is that at a very low value of mu where uh, I essentially have more or less a thermal diffusion like motion, there is no particular set of peaks visible in the uh, wave number space okay, which means it is there is a this is kind of a radial distribution function, but it is more or less axisymmetric. Whereas as mu increases so through 375, 495 and 525, you start to see what looks like the signature of a hexagonally close packed structure emerging. So as you go towards the phase transition, these are the early signs before you are able to get the crowd to move in a particular direction. So you first need to if you will cool them down from an axisymmetric radial distribution function to what looks like a hexagonally close packed structure where there is some positional order before you are able to influence a velocity order if you will. Okay, another interesting concept that we will I mean another interesting idea that we explored is to look at what is called giant number fluctuations. Giant number fluctuations is basically where if I take a small part of the domain and I want to see if the variance of the part, if the standard deviation of the particles in the domain would scale as square root of the mean number of particles. If they will, that means I can use all the power that central limit theorem gives me to understand the averaged properties of this system. Okay. Now we look at four different radial locations. So we pick a tiny pocket at four different radial locations in the domain and I am showing you the raw data as we got from the simulations because I thought this is more instructive. If you could draw a horizontal line with a reasonably high degree of confidence, that means it's, it obeys central limit theorem. So what we find is that for small radii, look, radial locations, it does indeed obey central limit theorem, but for, for large radii near 0 0.7 and 0 0.8, we start to see a deviation. This is the mean of those uh, of that data at different radial location, you start to see that sigma squared by n, which is just the square of the property you saw in the previous slide is more or less flat. So in other words, I can with a reasonably high 95 percent confidence draw a horizontal line for the inner radial locations, but not for the radial locations where the, where the clustering if you will is most visible. So in other words, where the velocity is the, is the greatest is also where you have groups of particles traveling together. And that groups of particles traveling is what is responsible for these number fluctuations. Okay, a quick summary, we discussed a novel model where dynamically active dense human crowds can be understood. We showed that the disorder order transition was first order. This is not our new finding, 
the new finding was that under confinement it still is a first order phase transition. We also showed that for finite domain sizes the width increases with domain size and the optimal placement of game changers has been shown to be where the uh, where the crowd is least panicked when when it is moving in the ordered phase. And finally, we showed that the model conclusions are reasonably robust for uh, many different kinds of uh, perturbations you want to add to the system. I want to last end with a utilitarian view of what this is useful for. Now, simply put you can answer a lot of what if questions. You can ask you know what if there was an obstacle at some place and you can understand the dynamics you know with many different designs of of this ok. Secondly, this is an emerging body of literature where we want to see if these stampede like spots have any resemblance to laminar turbulent phase transitions ok. Now, laminar turbulent transition the, the our modern thought for cases where the flows are linearly stable meaning stable to small perturbations we still see transition from a from a laminar flow to a turbulent flow. How does this happen? The our new uh, new thinking in the literature now is that there is a route through intermittent puffs of turbulence and these puffs of turbulence grow as the Reynolds number if you will increases. So, the transition is not a sharp transition at a particular critical Reynolds number as you would see if the flow is linearly unstable, but for a linearly stable set of flows this transition happens over a range of Reynolds numbers beginning with the in onset of initial puffs of turbulence to where you have essentially spots of laminar region left. So, there is a whole it is a continuous phase transition if you will this was very nicely investigated through a series of DNS simulations by Barclay recently. So, as a result I as a result of both of these I think a tool like this can be used to do first principles design of evacuation passages and estimating evacuation time if you will. Now, more broadly broadening the definition of where this could be used you know I think you know this kind of thinking where you bring rigorous science to a field that is mostly led by intuition and experience. If you really I you know thanks to this work I had a chance to actually talk to some people who were involved in the design of the crowd management system for the coomb and uh, you know they are very very knowledgeable people, but mostly the whole design is is based on uh, a, cert a certain intuition that they have built you know police officers who have seen large crowds they understand this in their heads and they are able to do it. And they use terms like you know we avoided bottlenecks we avoided we did a good streamline we tried to create a streamlined flow. So, the kinds of things we want to talk about, but with no mathematical backing if you will not that it is required always, but we have seen that it does indeed help in many other instances. And then in my opinion the last remaining frontier for physics and mathematics is modeling human behavior. I think it has done a reasonably good job of modeling life in a cell and this is the a much larger and a more difficult problem to crack. And I think both physics and math will take a shot at it in the next few years this is my take on on where we are ok. But the big problem in this whole in going to that last frontier is estimating what is mu, what is beta, what is alpha there is all these parameters how do I get those. I think early signs of answers to that are also available in the way we use data for example. There is lot of data now available. So, imagine everybody at the comb probably had a mobile phone on them and they were all transmitting their GPS locations to somebody and if one had access to all the data potentially one could develop algorithms to estimate these parameters. But I think this is the big problem as we stand. So, in other words like I said early on in my literature classification slide there are no controlled experiments possible at this scale, which means you are left with accident videos or other CCTV footage and you have to go to work with it essentially and do some form of estimation. So, imagine I had an enclosure like this just to generalize the problem that we discussed if one were to imagine a streamline and a couple of vortices in these two corners this would be the optimal placement location for essentially invigorating a, st a stagnant crowd to start moving in a you know towards the exit if you will ok. You can reach out to any of those pu recent publications some from our group and some from uh, from other groups uh, for more on these ok. Thank you very much for, for your attention appreciate it a lot.